Tonight on Talking Politics, the state government in Massachusetts has long been known as one of the least transparent in the country. In fact, this is the only state where the governor, the legislature, and the courts all claim to be exempt from public records laws. But soon that could change, thanks to new governor Maura Healey. We'll get into why and how ahead. First, though, before digging into her first full day on the job, Healey and her lieutenant, Kim Driscoll, took some time to celebrate last night. I too want to thank Brian and Barbara and KDPB, the folks at TD Garden, Delaware North, especially the workers who worked all day. It's amazing. Thousands of people, including six-time Grammy winner Brandi Carlisle, came out to support Healy's history-making inauguration hours after she took the oath of office, officially taking the reins from now former Governor Charlie Baker. So what does the transition mean for Massachusetts, and what can we expect from Healy's first few weeks in office? Joining me to discuss are GBH News State House reporter Katie Lannon and Boston Globe politics reporter Samantha Gross. Thank you both for being here. You guys were at the big shindig last night, right? What was the, before we get into the, the substantive, meaningful stuff, what was the scene like there? It was uh, raucous. There was uh, obviously Brandy Carlisle's performance was kind of the highlight of the evening, um, but there were arcade basketball hoops. Um, really, there was, like the Papa shot. Yeah, things? Okay. like the little basketballs. Um, there was you know merch like foam fingers and uh, basketball stress balls, kind of being passed around. Um, appetizers like huge tables of charcuterie it was huh. it was quite a party yeah um, it, sounds, and it, was packed. it sounds impressive katie how did that compare to you know maybe previous events that you've covered along the same lines yeah, I mean, the, the basketball theme is, of course, a, a Maura Healy signature. She and Kim Driscoll had matching white high-top sneakers that they showed up showed, showed off when they came out. There was a real, you know, party atmosphere. It was fairly casual. It was exuberant. There was part concert, part power player cocktail hour, part arcade games. Um, so, and there was a lot of, you know, symbolism in kind of the way it was run, not just the basketball motif, but there was a land acknowledgement. There was a... Ah, saying that we are on indigenous yep, land. Exactly. Interesting. Exactly. There was a dance troupe that focuses on uh, disability rights. So there oh, was a lot of different kind of things woven in there, acts from... Springfield to Salem, uh -huh. so it really tried to get a lot conveyed in there in that party mode. You know, when you and uh, Esteban Bustillos were covering it for us, I was thinking, you know, oh, I'm happy that I'm not on this and I can go to bed early. And your description is almost making me, almost making me it wish was done that, by eight. that I had been there. Oh, that, that <laughs> is was. exactly my kind of event. All right, let's get, well, I, should, I was going to say a little more substantive, but it sounds like there were some substantive takeaways from that. But let's talk about her inaugural speech. Samantha, in my experience, in a speech like this, there usually tends to be one or two ideas or uh, proposals that pop out and catch your attention. Did anything rise to that level for you with Healy's speech? Yeah, it definitely felt, um, I mean, it was part inaugural address, but it almost felt like a state of the state where she was talking about, you know, some of the big issues that she wants to tackle as governor. Um, housing and workforce um, and transportation were the three things that kind of popped out to me, talking about, you know, how to make the state affordable um, for the people who live here, how to help people get around better um, in a safe way, and also how to be competitive, um, you know, compared to other states with keeping people and businesses here. Um, yeah. Katie, how about you? Definitely housing and transportation struck me as well. A lot of focus on climate, wanting to go big on climate tech, uh, saying that she today would issue an executive order to formally name her climate chief, and a, a possible signature uh, budget program. She says she wants to put in her first budget a program that would make community college free for students over 25 who don't have a, a college degree already, and that's the the kind of thing that could become a landmark if it gets through. Yeah, for what it's worth, uh, one thing that struck me was the way she balanced, I thought, a very touching tribute to the idea of Massachusetts exceptionalism with a pretty forthright acknowledgement of how bad things are in some areas. You guys mentioned the T, the dearth of affordable housing. And to do that, I think, to, to on the one hand say, hey, you know, this is a special place and we do a lot of things really well, and at the same time, to candidly address things that aren't going great. I, it's a tricky balance to strike, and I thought she did it. Uh, Katie, was there anything that Healy didn't say in her speech or anything she addressed differently than you expected her to? 
She did stick to a lot of what she has said on the campaign trail. Um, details that we maybe haven't heard her talk about in events as much, but were in her plan policy plans. Now, one thing that I did notice that was that she didn't get into a lot of specifics about tax reform, which she has said would be an early priority for her, aside from uh, mentioning rental deductions specifically. She talked about wanting to do it. Child tax credit, yep, right? Absolutely that as well, which is another campaign trail item. But we didn't hear necessarily a when or a how when we did hear her on some other things very specifically say, this will be in my first budget, or mm -hmm. I've already directed my team to look at this. You have, in a way with that answer, anticipated my next question to Samantha. He and we've talked about it on this show before, she's taken criticism in some quarters, I think primarily media quarters, but also maybe among some activists for being vague about her plans, both during the campaign and after winning election. I was going to ask you if you think that her speech yesterday will at least you know, make those criticisms more subdued. What do you think? Does she now have a detailed policy agenda that people are going to accept? Or are people still going to be saying, hey, come on, you're not telling us these key things? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, not everyone is always going to be happy with what they hear, and I think there are definitely specifics that maybe folks are looking for. But she did lay out, you know, some really specific uh, timelines. Was one thing that I picked up on for when she's going to do certain things. Like um, she said, 60 days she's going to hire a transportation safety chief, which mm -hmm. is something was a campaign trail promise. Um, obviously really important as there's a lot of safety concerns around transit here um, on the T especially. She said uh, in a year she'll hire a thousand workers for MBTA operations, which it's huge. Um, the like workforce shortage on the T seems to be, you know, one of the biggest issues. That one jumped out at me too because I mean, yeah. that's, a, that's a big hiring commitment to sure. make and to, to hold yourself to. Did I interrupt yeah. you? Were you going to mention Oh, there was days? one more that I, I kind of picked up on, which was the 100 days uh, to hire a standalone housing chief. She's separating economic development and housing um, cabinet level positions. And so she's already hired uh, the economic development cabinet secretary, um, but she said in the next 100 days she'll hire someone specifically to focus on housing, which was a campaign trail promise as well. Let me ask you both, how significant is it that she is splitting those two functions? Is that a big deal? It strikes me as one, but I'm not entirely sure why or what it means. It's a big deal, but I also believe it's a return to how it used to be. There were previously housing and economic development secretariats before they were combined into kind of a, a super secretary, I think it was called at the time. Who could, you got to refresh me. Oh, you're putting me up. Was it Deval Patrick? I it, think it, it might have been. It could be. And I mean, uh, I'm, yeah, I didn't mean to put you on the spot. The spot. I, I, what <laughs> I want to do is acknowledge my ignorance here, but I didn't realize that it had, or I did not remember that it used to be split. Yeah, so it, but it is definitely sending a message um, that she, as she talked about during her speech, that, that housing, the costs have become unacceptable. It needs to be prioritized. And she did say she wants everyone to, to join in on the commitment to, to make zoning changes, to make it easier to j build housing here in Massachusetts. That'll be interesting to watch moving forward. Samantha, uh, Maura Healy has announced a bunch of big hires mm -hmm. since. Um, taking over, especially in the last couple of weeks, I say since taking over, she's taken over yeah. for uh, precisely one day. In the run-up to her, her inaugural, yeah. she's announced a bunch of big hires. What do they tell us collectively about how she plans to govern, if any? Yeah, I mean, I think that the mix of public sector and private sector picks, you know, for to fill these roles is interesting and maybe shows, you know, that the new governor will be listening to the private sector kind of you know, balancing both things. I think that's interesting. She's also pulled a lot from people that she's worked with before in the attorney general's office um, and people from other uh, gubernatorial administrations, um, especially like the Patrick administration and the first few hires. So uh, I think it'll be interesting. Yeah. Am so. I right to say it strikes me as a, a notably diverse group? Is that yeah. correct? A lot of women, a lot of people call it? Yeah, the um, economic development uh, secretary that she announced this week is the first woman and first person of color to hold the role, um, they say. So I think that's really big. Um, you know, Patrick Tutwiler is the first black secretary of uh, education, which was one of the first picks that she mm -hmm. announced really early on. And yeah, the cabinet secretaries have been uh, notoriously white. And um, I think it's certainly white making male, a statement. Right? White and male. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, Katie, the members of the House and Senate have spent eight years working with Governor Baker. They seem, I know they clash sometimes, but mm -hmm. they struck me from the outside as having a better relationship with him over the course of his tenure than they had with Deval Patrick when he was governor. There seemed to me during the Patrick years to be more overt friction there. What, if anything, are you hearing from them about how they expect things to play out with Healy moving forward? 
Well, I think there's a, a few things of note here. And before I answer your exact question, I want to note, too, that a lot of the people she's brought into her cabinet and her senior staff have worked as legislative aides or in other roles within the legislature before. I'm glad you did. Um, which could be a way that she might be looking to head off that friction, giving people getting people in her inner circle who know the, the dynamics of the legislature. And certainly she has a relationship with lawmakers from her time as attorney general. Um, one thing, Senate Minority Leader Bruce Tarr, who's a, a Republican, who's been really a, a voice for Baker's policies in the legislature, he said to me yesterday that he heard a lot of common themes from Maura Healey, as he heard from Governor Baker, uh, including housing, tr mm -hmm. climate issues. These are all things that are, there's a sense of continuity among at least some in the legislature that they're going to be, you know, kind of picking up where they left off in terms of at least themes, if not how you yeah. approach them. So I think there's a, a willingness to build a Charlie Baker-esque relationship. Huh. But we'll, we'll see how it goes. That's fascinating. I'd wondered if there might be some territoriality, like I think we saw with Patrick. Those you know, kind of power struggles yeah. over who gets to set the agenda. Let's and there might be. Things. We saw, you know, Senate President Karen Spilka wants to make community college free for all students. And Governor Healy is talking about yeah. a specific subset. So that could be a flashpoint. And, you know. There's always a chance for drama. Before we talk really briefly about uh, former Governor Charlie Baker, well, I've been asking you guys all sorts of questions about Healy's inaugural, what we learned from it. I've been remiss in not rolling just a little bit of the speech for people who might have missed it or might want another look at it. So let's just take a quick look at some of um, what she had to say yesterday along those lines that I was talking about earlier about Massachusetts exceptionalism. In this state, we're all trailblazers. We're all leaders. No matter the challenges we face ahead, we will stay true to the best of ourselves. We will act with empathy and equity. So let's talk a little tiny bit about Charlie Baker. I'm not sure how much more there is to say at this point, but he had this highly ritualized exit right before Healy was inaugurated. Did anything strike either of you as notable uh, in terms of the way he comported himself on the way out? Or was it basically, my sense is that he said some of the things we would have expected him to say, took credit for victories that we would expect him to take credit for. Is that fair? Yeah, I think so. Um, really, the the lone walk itself, his symbolic exit from the State House, there was not a lot of a speaking program of any sort at yeah. that point. So his goodbye was kind of the day before when, as you said, he pretty much said what you'd expect him to say. I think one thing that is of note that really talks to the way Charlie Baker ran his administration is it's called the lone walk, right? He didn't do it alone. He went out with his lieutenant governor, Karen Polito, hmm. with each of their spouses. They handled that walk together. Um, you know, Polito, I think when I interviewed her on her way out, she said she almost served as a kind of two for the price of one co-governor alongside him taking on her own kind of portfolio working with cities and towns. So I think that was really a, a last symbolic gesture that they really were a team. I see you nodding. Do you, do you agree with Katie's assessment? Did you want to add anything? Or yeah, no, absolutely. Through? I was also there kind of seeing the not so lone walk happen. <laughs> um, and I think what I found to be interesting, because I was in the crowd talking to people who had showed up, you know, from the public and also, you know, aides, uh, other lawmakers. Um, it definitely seems like, you know, kind of an emotional moment, uh, yeah. but not anything that was super surprising. Um, a lot of people are going to miss the, you know, the former governor. Yeah. Uh, closing question. I'm going to start with you and then go to Katie. I'm really interested in your take on whether Maura Healey will enjoy some of the benefit of the doubt that it seemed to be voters extended to Charlie Baker, even when things went wrong. Deaths at the Holyoke Soldiers Home early on in COVID. The T, you know, is still in bad shape as he leaves after eight years. Voters never seem to hold it against Baker personally. They seem to see those as, you know, problems that might need addressing or should have been handled differently. But they continued to give Baker high marks no matter what happened. Um, do you think, uh, Samantha, and then I'd like to get your take, Katie, and then we'll wrap it up there. Do you think that voters are going to be similarly charitable or generous when it comes to evaluating Healy? Or is the fact that she's a Democrat, the fact that she's a woman, maybe going to see the or lead to the public processing what she does and doesn't do a little bit differently? Yeah, it's an interesting question. I talked to some people about this um, for a story this week. Uh, you know, 
there is still sexism in politics. Um, Maura Healy and Charlie Baker are not the same person. Um, but when it comes to her governing style, I think that we will see some similarities. And I think it'll just be left to see, be seen how people receive that. Yeah. Um, you know, even on the campaign trail, she was really down the middle on a lot of issues. Her speech echoed a lot of kind of Bakerisms, talking about you know tax relief. Um, you know, climate tech, building out a, you know, a In corridor. a certain tone, right? The state yeah. has like, well, we'll keep it high-minded. We won't bicker. Right. right. And speaking directly to the business community, which is something that he did too. So I think it's kind of left to be seen how that's received, but um, they are really different people. And obviously she has some other factors kind of playing against her when it just comes to, you know, the way people historically have acted in politics. Katie, I'm asking you to speculate just like I asked Samantha, <laughs> but what's your prediction if you have one? Yeah, I mean, I think you both have said alluded to the double standard there, that's a potential, but a couple things that might work in her favor is one, you know, one of the things that helped Governor Baker was that he didn't get a lot of criticism from the top Democrats in the state, right? Yep. There were attacks sometimes from within his own party, but no one really went on the offensive from within the state house. Unlikely to see Democrats going after a Democrat here. So yeah. without a, an attack f to latch on to, you might see her kind of still be able to float above things. Uh, similarly, some of the pollsters I've talked to say that the big problems facing the state, there's things like the cost of housing, the transportation mess, mess yeah. um, is really are sometimes seen by voter, voters as intractable issues yeah. that, you know, as long as you're making steps towards it, talking about it in some way, might be seen as beyond the realm of any one politician to fix. That makes a lot of sense and is also slightly depressing. <laughs> but, but intuitively, it fits. Katie Landon, Samantha Gross, thank you both. Thanks, Adam. On the campaign trail, Maura Healey was loath to differentiate herself from now former Governor Charlie Baker. Jokes about their height gap aside. But she did make one promise on Boston Public Radio a couple weeks back that would set her administration apart from his. Will you confirm that you will not claim exemption from public record laws as governor and we support legislation that at least cuts back whatever exemptions the legislature and judiciary believe they have? Yes and yes. Oh, well, that takes care of that. Okay. That was easy. If Healy keeps her promise, she'll be the first governor in decades to open up her office to public records requests. But it's probably going to be a bit tougher to get the rest of state government aboard. As my next guests know all too well, I'm joined now by Robert Birchie, general counsel to the New England Newspaper and Press Association and a member of the Mass Supreme Judicial Court's Judiciary Media Committee, and Mike Dean, co-author of the Daily Newsletter from Axios Boston. Thank you both for being here. So um, I should note at the outset, Rob, Governor Baker's office would accept public records requests, but they also argued that in some cases they could claim an exemption based on an old ruling that we'll get into a little bit later. As someone who's worked on these issues for a long time, how significant is the commitment that Healy's made? Uh, two answers for you, Adam. It's hugely significant, uh, and it's not worth a paper that it's not written on. Uh, and what I mean by that is, you know, the, the public records law really is the way that constituents can know what's going on in the government. Uh, it is our tie to being involved in a democracy. Uh, so that's important. It's also our way of getting information and holding our politicians accountable. Uh, you talked in the previous segment about uh, Massachusetts exception, exceptionalism. Yeah. Uh, we were exceptional uh, in the eyes of Center for Public Integrity uh, two years ago when they gave us an F in public records. Um, we are one of two states where the governor has not been subject to the public records law. One of uh, the only state, I believe, where the three branches of the legislature uh, have been deemed not subject to a public records law. Um, we've seen changes in the law over the last few years that have improved that situation. And I think uh, Governor Hilly's, uh commitment is huge there. That said, the law hasn't changed. So her voluntary uh, agreement to subject herself to the law is a little bit of an act of noblesse oblige. Hmm. Uh, you look at the website of the governor's office now, and it's wonderful to see the portal that allows you to put in 
requests and designates a records officer. But then you look at the fine print at the bottom of it, and it says, please note that the office of the governor is not one of the instrumentalities enumerated in the public records law, and therefore its records are not subject to disclosure but under just, the public records law. I know exactly the part you're talking about, but just to jump in, that's a, a relic of Charlie Baker's tenure. And I would assume that if Maura Healy keeps good on her, her promise, that we're not going to see that there anymore. Even if we don't see it anymore, when the case comes where she denies access to some uh, uh, request under the public records yep. exemptions that exist, when that goes up on appeal, there, I got gotcha. you. Public records law doesn't kick in. Hold that thought. I want to get back to the scenario that you conjured up um, in just a moment. But Mike Dean, in your work covering previous gubernatorial administrations, has the exemption that the governor is able to claim under uh, our our existing law, has it kept you on any occasion from getting information that you really wanted to? Uh, yeah, well, it's almost, we don't know what the information is that is being withheld in a lot of ways. Um, one thing that Healy's change would kind of change for reporters is that uh, we would be able to know when and who is seeing different kinds of information. Right now, uh, the way it is set up, it, the um, agencies are subject to the public records law. And we get a lot of our information by doing FOIA or the state version of FOIAs for, uh, you know, Cabinet secretaries, yep. agency heads, Department things of like Health, that. I remember doing during COVID. Yeah, exactly. What we don't know a lot of time is their communications with the governor's office. Yeah. Uh, sometimes that is how we find out about the governor's office because they're emailing their secretaries, things like that. But we don't really know things about the chief of staff's role or actions. We don't really know about lieutenant governor, for instance. Karen Polito was hugely involved in the reopening of uh, uh, businesses during COVID mm. and, and during the pandemic. And now we're going to have uh, Kim Driscoll, who could be an even more influential and powerful lieutenant governor in that role, and we don't really know what she'll do um, or, or who she's been talking to. It's really, it's about communication. It's about who has the governor's ear and uh, which staff members who are kind of off the record, so yeah. to speak, uh, how they're being agents of the governor. And not necessarily elected in many cases by, by us, right? Serving people we elected, but not chosen by us. Let me ask you both about the scenario that Rob conjured up just a minute ago, because I'm really interested in this. Um, I, I interviewed Bill Galvin briefly yesterday We'll hear from him in a moment. He said, uh, when it comes to Healy's commitment, basically, we'll, we'll wait and see, but I appreciate her saying she's going to do this. And he also mentioned that Healy, as AG, was a good ally to his office. He oversees the implementation of public records law, uh, that he saw her as someone who took this stuff seriously. Rob, you conjured up a scenario a moment ago in which Healy gets a request that maybe she doesn't want to comply with. And despite publicly saying, I'm not going to claim this exemption, goes on to claim this exemption. Do you really think that's likely to happen? Because I would think politically it would make her look really bad if she's been on the record saying, I'm not going to do this, and then she turns around and does it. Well, I mean, keep in mind, there are legitimate exceptions under the law, um, you know, sorts of documents that do not have to be produced, even if you are subject to the law. So she could, in good faith, claim one of those exemptions. Um, and when that exemption gets challenged because the requester says, I don't think that exemption applies when you apply the public records law, the judge is going to say, well, I don't need to apply the public records law because it doesn't apply hmm. to the governor. I see. I see. So she would she might. And by the way, we should say um, this to remind me of the name of the ruling that created the, the Lambert Lambert, um, which I know a lot of people say was was a bad ruling, including Secretary Galvin, who I mentioned a moment ago. So you're saying. Oh, were you going to, oh, you agree that it's a bad or was a bad ruling. So you're saying Healy could say under the public records law that applies to me, I do not believe we should have to provide this information. And then a judge could agree but cite Lambert as the reason. Am I getting exactly. that right? Exactly. Okay. I, I don't think the judge would apply a public records law that the SJC says doesn't apply I to the see. governor. Even if the governor is saying, come on and do it. Mike, do you agree? Do you think that this would be politically dicey if Healy is not as candid as she's at least indicating people should be? 
Uh, it definitely uh, could be a political problem for Healy if it goes that way. Um, but you know, there's always a lawyerly way out. And Rob mentioned that there are legal exemptions under the rule. Uh, definitely, the former uh, attorney general will be able and knowledgeable enough. Yeah. Um, her chief of staff is a former chief counsel to the governor's office, so they certainly know their way around the, the public records law and how it pertains to the executive office. Um, and yeah, we'll just have to be there and uh, vet whether or not that is an exemption that, uh, you know, passes the sniff test. And I guess one question is how much the public, even though, you know, I think we all agree that this is something the public should care about. Does the public really care about it? Is it something that even though it's important, people's eyes kind of gloss over when it's discussed? Hopefully not, since we're talking about it here in this segment. Uh, Rob, but Adam, uh, oh, I, there I is a way around that, sure. which is to actually change the law yep. to make it explicit that the governor is covered. And that might be in the governor's favor. Because then when she claims an exemption, she's tested by the rule of the law. Uh, that's interesting. Well, she's, she's uh, I, I don't think she's indicated that that's the approach she's going to take. But perhaps she'd be open to it. I, I want to get you to weigh in on something Secretary Galvin said to me. I asked him if the legislature might change the law, not when it applies to the governor's office, which Galvin had previously pushed them to do, but when it applies to themselves, whether they might say, we are no longer able to claim this uh, Lambert exemption. Here was uh, Secretary Galvin's response. What they will tell you is that it's because they want to protect the candor of discussion and debate on legislation. But okay, you could carve out an exception for certain negotiations or things like that. But for instance, you shouldn't have to carve out, why would their contracts or their employment practices or something like that be exempt? What, what does that have to do with negotiation? There's nothing. So it's a blanket exemption. And there's been numerous efforts, including from within the legislature. I don't want, I don't want to seem as if to say, there's nobody in the legislature has ever, no, people in the legislature have, have asked to do this through the years and, and to various degrees, and all of them have failed. Rob Birchie, do you agree with Secretary Galvin's pessimistic assessment, assessment about whether the legislature might follow Healy's lead here and take steps to pass a bill that says this doesn't apply to us? Unfortunately, I do agree. Uh, the, there are voices in the legislature calling for change. Uh, but I found it interesting, a couple of years ago, Northeastern journalism students did a study where they called up all the uh, incumbent and uh, uh, folks running for legislative offices in Massachusetts uh, and asked them uh, whether they supported change of the uh, public records law so that it would apply to the legislature. Not surprisingly, 72% of them said they supported the, of those who answered said they supported the change, because it's a little bit like asking them, do you support democracy? Say that number one more time, because your video glitched. 72% said they supported okay. such a change, but only 28% actually answered the question. And this after being hounded by the students with emails, telephone calls, et cetera. In other words, 72% gotcha. also avoided the question Most of them entirely. ran ahead. Got it. All right, well, we got to yeah. leave it there on that very depressing note. Robert, <laughs> Birchie, Mike Dean, thank you both. That's thank it you, for tonight. Madam. But do come back next week. And please, as always, tell us what you think. The email is talkingpolitics at wgbh.org. The website is gbhnews.org slash talkingpolitics. For now, thank you for watching and good night. Antiques.